Hello. <laughs> okay, we're going to wait a couple of minutes um, to see who shows up, but I hope you're all having a good week and things are a little bit better, I think, this week, just calmer with the election being over, thank God. <laughs> and um, I don't know, the end of the semester is sort of coming up slowly. So we've got about four more weeks. So we're gonna do an animation. We're gonna start on that today because that's probably the most time consuming of all the projects. But I wanna look at what you've done first. I'm downstairs today in my living room because I'm watching my dog who had just had surgery that she doesn't take her bandages off. So I've got this wobbly table. I'm just gonna try to whoa, put something under it so it doesn't do that constantly. better. Okay. So Liliana or Wendy, do either of you have any work that you want to show that's in progress? Uh, I, uh, I had I had this, um, the t shirt one, I just started, I just tried something new and using the same picture. You know, I have like, it's like a work in progress. But like, if you want to see it, you can Go, it's okay. I don't know if it's okay. I Is it in done. your um, final portfolio section? Yes. Hi, Caroline. Okay. Hi. How are you doing today? We're getting started slowly. Um, Wendy's got some t shirts. He's got a t shirt design that he had changed that he wants to show. So we're going to go and look at that in a minute. Do you have anything, Caroline, that you want to share with the class? Not ready, but. Not today, nothing I want to share yet. Just, okay. I'm just put it. So for oh, the t-shirt, for the t-shirt um, design mm -hmm. on the assignment, like, uh, description, it says that, like, we should choose something that kind of, like, represents us. Um, and I'm just kind of, like, having trouble trying to, like, find something that I feel like it would represent me and I'd like want to wear on a t-shirt and I think would look cool. Yeah, so that's right a hard part. Yeah. yeah, so right now I'm just trying to like figure out like what I could possibly like put on a t-shirt that would look cool and like represents me. Okay, I mean it doesn't have to be yourself directly. It could be an organization that you like that you would want to wear as a t-shirt, you know, something about that organization or a cause or an idea. So, I mean, if it feels uncomfortable to be putting something out directly about, you know, yourself or your own story on a t-shirt, which is understandable, you know, you could go that way. What have you thought about so far? Um, well, my favorite things to like, um draw and like do with art or flowers and like my my name is like Liliana Rose but like people call me Lily so I typically like to draw like lilies and roses together so right now I'm just looking at pictures of lilies and trying to think like if that could be like a possibility if I um, did like a like a flower design with those but I'm not sure yet okay I mean are you excited about that idea or do you think that you'd rather, you know, try some other things. I don't know. I feel like if I can't think of anything else, I'll probably end up doing that, but I still want to try to think of some other things first before I settle. Okay, that's always a good idea. Yeah, I mean, run out all your ideas, do sketches, and then, you know, if you decide that you do want to do flowers, there's so many ways that you could do those that would look fantastic. I mean, I think that would be fine to do. Yeah. And, you know, it is your name. I like that idea, so. You know, and they could be different. Think about different ways you could portray flowers so they're, you know, not your everyday flowers. So it's a little bit more personalized, but I think that would be fine. So, but you've got to, I mean, I think next Friday, if you can get the t-shirt designs to me by then, you know, via email, or you can put them in the final portfolios, but just let me know that they're there and which version you want um, done as a t-shirt, that would be fine too. But I need to know your size and the color of t-shirts you want. So if you go to look at vistaprint.com, you can see their different styles of shirts. I mean, they've got different fabrics, 
and you know men in women's shirts and then a few different colors you can pick from think about how your design is going to represent on a different color if you choose something other than white will it show up the ink's pretty non-transparent but it's got a little opacity to it so if you have a dark image on a dark shirt it's going to blend in a little bit so think about that when you make your choice and then also you know, send me your size your shirt choice and then your mailing address so when we get these back and they usually come back pretty quickly you know i can package them up and send them to you but i told kathy that i would try to get those into her by friday next week because she's going to place the order through the lab fees so you've got some time to work on it so wendy i'm going to go to share screen and we'll look at your design in the final portfolios Okay, so which one is it? Is it that one? one? I want to take this. Okay, so what do you, so if it's unfinished, would it, I actually like it the way it is, but what are you planning on doing to it? Um, so I was just trying like to make a character that looks just like me. And, and plus this took a while because I was doing all my um, cell phone. Wow, okay. So this is actually a sketch, and then after I was I was I just put it in there just because it was unfinished. And I was planning using the um, the first design that I showed you before with the bright colors, right? And put it around the background. Okay, that would work. And but then I, okay, colored the whole thing with bright colors and try and make it like around, make it like it's around the background. Yeah, I really like that idea. That would be fine because I like this character, you know, being front and center, you know, with some, you know, the other background, you know, as a found video image, I mean, computer image, but that's fine. You know, if you use this one is the dominant image in the design. So yeah. how did you do this on the, um, on your, I've never tried to draw anything on my iPhone. Did you use Photoshop? Uh, no, actually I use, um, I, I I use um um uh, a um drawing. There was one for a drawing that you use in your cell phones. Okay. Illustrated drawing. Yeah, I really I like it because it looks like it has different line weights to it. You know where the leg yeah. is a little bit thicker. That's really nice. I mean, it feels like pen and ink. So yeah, I think. If you put that background in, it should be fine. Are you going to leave the foreground where the clothing is white, or are you going to kind of let the colors blend in with that? Uh, I'm going to try to blend the colors with that a little bit. Okay. Um, you know, be careful because I think, you know, you don't want to lose your, your lines. So mm -hmm. however you can do that where you can keep your lines still visible, you know, maybe if some of that stays opaque in places and you let it blend with the color in other areas, that would be good. Yeah. Okay. But I think, yeah, I like it a lot. I think it'll be great. I like the character. that I don't know how this is gonna work if it goes really noisy I'll go upstairs with the computer but um yeah my neighbor's dog is barking and they all go ballistic but anyway I, I like your design I think that this would work great it's simple but it's got a lot of expressive qualities to it and I could see this animated so you might want to use it for the next assignment um, so you know try a different couple different versions of it save it as you go you know as you're blending it in keep um saving versions with separate names and then we can look at all of them maybe next class if you do that and decide which one would print best on the shirt but i really like this and i would save it you know again so you can use it for other things so any other comments i'm sorry i can't see the chat so there's probably something there um, if you've got something to add or suggestions um, add them there 
but yeah, it's really, it's very expressive. It's simple, but really expressive. And again, that's going to work good for the assignment. If you want to use something like this or this one for the next one we're going to do. So I'm going to stop the share for a second. Okay. Um, Liliana, do you have anything else you would like to share from that or any other assignment? Uh, no, I thank God I, I've shared all the things that I have in my portfolio so far. Okay, so let's go over the next assignment. And if more people don't come in, hopefully they'll watch the video and they can get the assignment there. This is the one that's the most time consuming, your animation assignment, because there's just, have you used the um, timeline in Photoshop, Liliana? Not yet. Okay. Have you, Wendy or Caroline? What did you say? Have you used the timeline menu in Photoshop before? No. I haven't. Okay, so, um, you know, it's pretty much new to all, and Liliana's, you know, probably looked at it, but it's not, it seems complicated at first, but it's really not. But when you see the instructions, I put step-by-step -step instructions in your Blackboard, and if you follow those step-by-step, -step, it seems, It'll be fine, but it seems daunting because I've got five pages of instructions. So <laughs> let's look at those. When I type them out and try to break things down, um, the only thing that's complicated I would say about this is that if you leave out one of the steps, sometimes it won't work the way that you want it to. So it's important to you know do all those steps and that's why there's so many. But basically, once you get used to it, it's very simple. So I'm going to go to share screen and we'll look at the step-by-step -step instructions and the assignments. And then I have some sample videos to look at before we do the demo. So where are we? Back to Blackboard. Okay, so the assignment first. I took the last assignment for the t-shirts and put it in past assignments. So this is the current assignment number eight. And I think two weeks is a reasonable amount of time to finish this in. Have fun with it. Don't stress over it. It's really just to get the experience of doing this. And motion graphics and um, graphics that play out over the time or the over time are the crux of 4D design. That's really what it means when we have the courses like this online and everybody with a different system, it's really hard to do. Um, so we've done less of it this semester than I usually start this earlier, but we should be able to get through it. It depends on what kind of computer you have, how much memory your computer has to deal with this sort of thing um, that will you know, make, it, make you able to do a longer, or you may have to opt for a shorter video, but we're gonna keep it fairly short. But the goal for this assignment is finally to do some moving graphics and sequential imagery. So you're gonna be creating an animated personal story and that can be anything. We looked at some examples last class, um, but with the photo shot timeline tool. And we looked at some storyboards where people were sketching out their sequential images, imagining how they would like a video or animation to play out um, in terms of the story being translated to visual terms. And that's helpful. You probably will wanna do that just to sketch in your notebook. It doesn't have to be anything elaborate, really simple. Um, just to kind of get some idea of how you'd like each segment of your story to look. And then when you go to look for images on the internet or to draw them yourself, you'll have a guide in which to do that and to start collecting images. The main thing about doing a video, a timeline, um, animated video is that you're going to get a lot of lot of files. So if you stay organized and keep your files organized, it will be go much more easily. If you're searching all the time for files, when you start adding them into the timeline, you're going to get um, frustrated with it. So make a folder specifically for the animation assignment and put everything in there and everything related to it. And you can make folders within the folders for the different types of files you're going to save. So the main goal in this, rather than it's simplifying information, um, both in the, your video design, but in the use of Photoshop itself, the more simple your story, the more powerful it will be. So that's the hardest part is kind of taking a story that you want to tell 
and then distilling it down to its most important parts, its most interesting parts. And we'll look at different ways to do that with the examples we're going to see. So the objectives, technical objectives, are going to be learning to use Photoshop timeline menu to create a short frame animation, and then from that to create video, and learning to compress the information into a short time format, very short, like one to three minutes. Um, learning to tell a compelling story in 4D media by compressing and selecting information, the most important to the story. So rather than going into every detail, you're going to have to figure out which details are most interesting and then focus in on those um, and even exaggerate those. So we're going to look at some examples today of video examples, and you can look at more on YouTube or Vimeo. There's so many out there of animated short stories, but I picked some that I thought showed a range of ideas about how to compress a story and how to animate them in simple ways. And then go to the Blackboard readings folder and you can see this PDF that I put together. Here it is, five pages um, with the step-by-step -step instructions. Read through all of them just to get a feeling for how you're gonna be constructing these before you start even thinking about your storyboard. And then after that, you can start sketching out a simple storyboard just as stick figures if you want in your notebook or on any kind of paper, sort of laying out your ideas, what order they might want you might want them to appear in and how do you want each section to look? Is it a close up of somebody's face or is it a distance shot? Um, think about how cameras shoot close ups, medium shots where you see maybe a full body but close and then distance shots where you may see a figure way off in the distance. They all tell a different story. They all have different emotional impacts. So you want to think about how you're going to compose your screen with your subject in it. Um, and then what kind of media do you want to tell it? We can easily add music to your video and we can also add sound if you can record it as an MP3 file on your phone or your laptop, which you should be able to do easily. Um, do you want audio with it? You don't have to have it, but if you do, what kind of audio? Do you want text and images, images only, images and sound or everything um, all packed into one video? But then think about how you can tell your story by focusing in on just one or two of the details of the story to represent the whole. And that's a big idea in literature. A lot, if you look at a lot of film and you read a lot of stories, you'll see that most effective stories do that. Um, the filmmaker will take one aspect, maybe, you know, if you're telling the story of a family dynamic over generations, they won't show step by step telling the story, you know, so-and-so was born then, this one interacted with this one in a certain way, because that would be long and it would be boring. But if you show a story of a family meal and sort of show everybody interacting in a certain way, that can tell the story so much more effectively than a long drawn out description. So that idea is called, I can't, I never say that word in um, rhetoric, connectedy, connections, <laughs> connectishy. Um, and that's an important idea, synecdoche, there we go. Um, distilling something down where a small, one small object like the wheel of a car represents the whole car. You know, if you say you've got wheels, um, and you mean you've got a car. That's an example of that idea. If you show the story of a family eating dinner and interacting with one another to show the fi family dynamic rather than telling the story of their generations living together, that's also that same idea. And that's what really grabs your audience and pulls them in and gets them interested and learns the whole story by their own reading and their own assumptions of that shorter distilled story. It allows the viewer to breathe and to be able to make their own assumptions. And that makes always a more compelling watching experience if you think about the things that you watch. So anyway, after sketching your storyboard, use it to guide you when you go back to the step-by-step -step instructions in the readings folder and start composing and collecting images that you're going to add to your animated um, video, keep your storyboard there as a guide and that can help you set up your different shots and help you if you're finding things online that you're going to bring into your folder, folder to work with 
or for this assignment, you can draw your images when we go to look at the examples. I do not like drawing with a tablet even on Photoshop. I just don't like the slippery feel of it. I always draw things on paper and then scan it or photograph it and then bring those drawings into Photoshop and then either use the threshold tool to simplify it or a filter or I'll bring it into Illustrator like we did last class and turn it into a vector graphic. But that way I, I like the sketchy look. That's just my style. I feel like if you work in Photoshop, especially if you're you know, working without a tablet, you're going to get a very graphic look to the image, which is just fine if that's your preference. But for me, I'd like to work on paper first, and you may want to do that too. You could even take some stories, I mean, some artwork that you've already done and photograph it and scan it and bring it into Photoshop and work with that, and that will save you a lot of time. So you want to aim for a finished animated video that's one and three minutes long, which seems like a long time actually, but you'll find that you build it up very quickly and the trick is actually cutting things down so it doesn't get too complex. So let's look at the um, readings. And here it is as a PDF, creating a video story with frame animation in Photoshop, your step-by-step -step instructions. So you can just open that up and work with it on the computer or print it out but there's three sections in it. Um, one is doing the animated segments in the timeline. Um, the next is adding some audio and then finally creating the video from this. Okay, so that's in readings. So let's go to videos. Hi, Anthony. <laughs> and we'll look at some examples in the stories telling with sequential images and digital design. And um, this one is actually the simplest story I've seen. It came from the um, StoryCorps website. And I tried to show this last week, and it's the one that I didn't put the right link in for. But this is just a still portrait with audio over it. And that's about as simple as you can get. But the story is very compelling. And it's also a really good example of that idea of synecdoche, where the, guy, the person telling the story is telling his experience in the military through a simple story of one thing that happened. And through that one simple thing that happened to him, um, when he was in the military, you get a feeling for his whole experience of what that was like for him of the military itself. And that's much simpler, much more compelling than try to step, sort of tell a chronological um, story of his time that he spent in the military. So let's watch that first. And it's really short. Former Army Specialist Garrett Reppenhagen has always loved Halloween, so much so that even during his deployment in 2004, he still found a way to celebrate. Over StoryCorps Connect, Garrett told his friend Tom Cassidy, who he served with at the time, about a costume choice that almost landed him in hot water, dressing up as his team leader. My sniper leader, Sergeant Richardson, he was a character. You know, he's got a shaved head, ears sticking out of the side, mustache, kind of a surly dude too. So I thought it'd be really funny if I dressed up like Sergeant Rich and I had to steal his uniform with a rank and nameplate on it. The morning of Halloween, I bicked my head, I shaved my mustache down to a perfect square. I had bubble gum in my cheek to make it look like I had chew in my mouth at all times. <laughs> and to get the ears right, I got some toothpicks and I popped those suckers out. <laughs> and uh, I headed to the chow hall for breakfast. You know, folks kind of see me, they're chuckling and I dig into my omelet and the doors of the chow hall slam open and in walks the sergeant major. Uh-oh. Command Sergeant Major, he's the highest ranking dude on our entire base. He's always kind of pissed, like he's got this general aura of anger, but he's not extra angry till he gets about like five feet from me. Oh, and you pulled the okie doke on him. I think he was looking for Sergeant Richardson to talk to him about something, and I knew I was dead. And he says, Marvin Hagen. I popped up into the position of attention, my chair fell over, and he says, what the hell are you doing? And I say, I'm eating breakfast, Sergeant Major. He says, no, what are you doing with that? 
and he's pointing right at Sergeant Rich's uniform and nameplate. And I say, it's Halloween, Sergeant Major. <laughs> and he says, throw your chow away, go back to your bunk, and you're not going to leave till I come get you. So I haul butt back to my bunk, and I paste. In the United States Army, it is against the law to impersonate a non-commissioned officer. That's true. So I was scared. Hours later, a slamming fist hits my door. So I swallow hard, I swing open the door, and it is the Sergeant Major. And he says, Reverend Hagen, that's the most fine Halloween costume I've ever seen in my life. And he took a couple pictures and walked away. I think in a lot of ways, we survived that deployment in Iraq by sharing humor with each other. Sergeant Rich never really forgave me, but I hope that he thinks about that and laughs sometimes. We were doing an awful job in an awful time. And uh, if I shed any joy to anybody on that base that day, then I think it was all worth it. seems like a fairly, um, I'm going to stop the share for a second, whoops, a fairly straightforward story, but when you think about the different parts that you just heard, it's not really, um, you know, mainly because the audio, he's in a conversation with somebody. So think about how that would appear if that was the same person sort of facing the camera and just talking directly as a talking head, would it have been as interesting? Or does that second person there that you know is listening one-to-one um, -one make that more interesting? Or does it make it less interesting? Um, I also like that he uses a humorous story to illustrate the idea of authority. And that could go in a much different way if he had chosen to do it. You still get a feeling for the authority structures, but it's much lighter and in a way it's more compelling and it has more pathos or more sadness to it because it's funny. So I think that that's actually a really beautiful, um, a beautifully constructed video without much visual information there except for somebody's face. Um, so any opinions about that? Did you agree or do you feel like it's too boring to watch it in that format? Whoops, go back to chat. Okay, well, let's look at another one. This one's very different. And I'm going back to share again. Uh, this one is from YouTube. There's a whole section. I'm a horror story kind of fanatic, horror film fanatic, um, mystery story. That and I just like that kind of stuff. So anyway. This is a series of animated nightmares that are true stories that people have experienced and have chosen to put into animated form. So this is done with an animated app, animation app. You can tell because there's a certain style to the figures. And if you look online, you are welcome to use these apps. There's so many out there. They have pre-drawn backgrounds, pre-drawn figures with kind of motion to them. And if you want to try that, you can. I didn't want to list all the ones that are out there. There's different ones for PCs and the iPhone and the Mac. So um, you can if you want to. I don't get as much personal feeling from them as I do from some hand-drawn ones, even though these look much slicker. But you can see for yourself. My name is Samuel. I've tried a variety of part-time jobs to earn a few bucks while studying. Like the pizza delivery guy. It was late one summer night, just past midnight, and I had to deliver my last order to a rich neighborhood nearby. When I got there, the house seemed old and there were no lights on inside. I rang the bell attached to the fence pillar a few times, but no one replied. I pushed the gate, it was unlocked, and I walked through the garden up to the porch. I found a note attached to the door. It said, the door is open, enter, and leave the pizza on the table. I hesitantly made my way inside. 
the hallway was dark and I couldn't find the light switch, so I used my phone light. There was a table in the middle of the living room and it had some money on it. I put the pizza box down and quickly pocketed the money. Suddenly, the door slammed shut behind me, startling me. I shone the torch towards the entryway, but there was nobody there. I ran a few steps forward and pulled on the door, but it was somehow jammed and I couldn't open it. I called for somebody in the house, but apparently I was alone. In the distance, a phone could be heard ringing from across the room. I picked it up. A man's voice said, if you don't do what I tell you, you'll be dead soon. What kind of a joke is this, dude? Let me out, I replied. Go to the kitchen, he said and hung up. I tried to dial 911, but my phone had no signal. I picked up the other phone, but it was locked. I tried to open the windows, but to my horror, each window had old rusted nails hammered through the frame, keeping them firmly shut. Using my flashlight, I slowly walked through a corridor into the kitchen. That place was a dump. There were no signs of life. On the table, there was a timer and a note read, that's how long you have left in this world. That scared me, so I began searching for something to use as a weapon, but I found nothing. I opened another door and I was immediately hit by a terrible smell. It was a bathroom. I bumped into the bathtub, filled to the brim. As I stood, staring in confusion, something bobbed to the surface. That's when I realized the bath was full of what seemed like human bodies. I threw up my guts covering the floor as I realized that this was not a joke. I noticed a small vent above the bathroom mirror. I clambered on top of the sink and began to shout, hoping to get somebody's attention. I stopped as a beeping sound began from outside. It was the timer in the kitchen. The beeping sound grew louder and the door eased open with a creak. And I saw a man standing in the dark, an ax in hand. He smiled as he said, your time is over. The man was huge. I knew I had no chance of overpowering him. I spun around and backed off into another room. I ended up in a cluttered room full of things and I began throwing anything at him, all that I could possibly reach. I got him right in the head with a lamp. He closed his eyes and stopped for a moment. He then smiled and kept coming forward. He eventually cornered me inhaled deeply and raised his ax. Without thinking, I took a piece of the broken lamp and slashed it across his cheek. As he recoiled, I slipped under his arms and rushed to the hallway. The door was unlocked now, so I got out and ran to my bike. I sped off as fast as I could without so much as looking back or fear of seeing him still chasing me. When the police arrived, the man was gone. Turns out, that house had been closed off to the public for the past 20 years, and someone was using it to lure people and use them for their own entertainment. Thank God I got out of that place. Right before he could slice me like a piece of pizza. Okay, so what did you think about that kind of story being told with that kind of animation? <clears throat> Sorry. Do you think it fits the mood of the story? Did it make it less or more interesting? What do you think, Kaylee? Yeah. Um, oh, either one. Wendy, what do you think? <laughs> do you think you'd like it better if it was video? Or do you think that, I mean, because the animation's kind of humorous because a lot of those apps kind of have generic people and they all look really nice and clean and, you know, the backgrounds do too. I was going to say, you see a lot of these spammed on YouTube. Yeah. Um, but. Do you think that it works with the story? Or do you think that the animation style detracts from the story? I personally don't really like them just because, I don't know, like I said, these are like notoriously like kind of spread all over YouTube, these um, like story time animations that 
don't really <laughs> fit the the mood of what they're telling, but. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I like this series just because it's so weird to have this kind of, yeah, the story package or the, you know, storyboarding app making these animations about this subject where these are true stories. <laughs> it just seems bizarre. It's easier to watch them in a way, but in some ways it makes them, for me, more compelling just because of the jolly sort of animated characters and the colorful graphics with the bizarreness of the stories. But mm. There are a lot of them. This look is very ubiquitous. So, you know, Wendy, what do you think? I think it was pretty funny. I mean, it was pretty funny. It's like tech. It, it was. It was not like it doesn't have the spooky vibe, but it was just funny. Yeah, I think it is really humorous. I don't know if that was the intention of the person that made it. <laughs> I mean, that could be a problem. But I like it because it's humorous too. It's funny because maybe it's just because the graphics don't match the tone of the story. But um, yeah, I think they're really interesting. Again, if you choose to use, I mean, Kaylee came in a little bit later, but if you want to use one of these apps to do the assignment, hey, you can. But what you just described about them, they're all over the internet. They look very much like this style. They all have the same kind of faces for the characters, the same kind of motion. Um, the advantage to them is you want a person walking, you can just choose an icon for a person walking, you know, and choose your character. Right, it's very convenient. Yeah. So they're... if you want to throw something quick together for like a presentation or um, if you want to put something up on YouTube and you just don't know how to do animation yet or you're learning and you don't want um, to you know, not be able to put something out. Um, I think it's a good option for that. Yeah, for presentations, definitely. I think that's what they were designed for. Um, but I mean, I think what you said is really important. I mean, there's a very um, sameness about all of these. So, you know, as far as your portfolio goes, I don't know, I mean, you probably you want to do some original drawings. But it's a good way to learn about moving graphics and put piecing together a story with segments of moving graphics. So, you know. It's yeah, it's a good that. building block, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I could think I like these horror stories done this way just because it's such a weird combination. It's just, and like Wendy said, it's humorous to see this. Yeah, kind of, this I agree. It's it, I kind of like the like juxtaposition of the the style. Like it's very cartoony and like friendly um and then you have these like horrific <laughs> stories that they're trying to tell yeah and I like that they're true they say they're true I mean I kind of I relate to this one because I had something similar happen not that bad but with a job I had when I was in college with a weirdo there that I got out of so I'm like I tend to believe them but something that, you know, if you go through that, there's a lot of emotions involved with it. And the characters are fairly cold. So it's funny, but it's also very weird. So I don't know about the juxtaposition. I'm still, you know, they're entertaining, though. And I, I do enjoy watching them because there is a sense of humor to it. But let's look at, um, let's see if I can get out of this one just by going to... Another one that is simple, but it's hand drawn. It's really somebody just taking their storyboard and see how you think that compares the style with the other one um, and creating a story from their animatics. Just not figure out a way to get us out of here. 
too many colors enough to drive all of us insane are you dead sometimes i think i'm dead because i can feel ghosts and ghouls wrapped in my head and i don't want to fall asleep just yet I'm just gonna, well, what did you think about that one? I'm going to reshare because I hit the YouTube thing. Um, so did you find that one as interesting as the other one? Or did you like the style of the hand-drawn sort of almost like pieces? I was going to say, I think this one meshes a little bit better. Like, even though it's a lot simpler, I feel like the art style and the narrative conveyed fits better with the software that they were using and the music that they chose. Like, everything just worked together better. Um, so I think it was more successful, even though it was simpler. What about the graphics that they meshed more with the story or the music? Um, I don't know. Like, I think the art style is very, it fits like the narrative, like that kind of art style I see a lot on, um, like a lot of younger people use, especially like on Tumblr and places like that. Right, and right. the story of this person that's trying to find their identity, you know, that's something a lot of young people go through. So I think that the music that they chose about trying to find, you know, find themselves and then having the story about this person who's trying to figure out their identity as a man and um, everything else, I think it, it just fit better. Yeah, what did you agree with? You? Yeah, I like the gray background and sort of the soft graphics. But, um, what did you think, Wendy? Whoops. Uh, oh, uh, I agree with most of the stuff that you said because um, it does have. It's, it, it's I'm upset. Okay, I'm going to shut it off for a second. I cannot fall. There. Whoops. Okay, we're back. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yes, yeah, it's going on to the next one. What did you think? I agree with, with your with your opinion, and they it is better than the other one, and it's more like in tune with the music okay. and with the animation, and I and the art looks awesome too behind it too. So, so you did like the artwork? Yes. Yeah, I like that style. I do. I mean, I think that a lot can be done with that, and. It's fairly, it's simple the way they've placed the pieces together, but I mean, there's probably dozens and dozens and dozens of segments, you know, that they um, either scanned or photographed to put together. And there's a lot of apps that do that. You can do that with Photoshop. So that's an option, you know, using the pre-drawn graphics. For me, I like that option better than trying to draw direct. But, um, you know, again, it's up to you. You could even use something photographic 
and manipulate it and make a sequence you know, or several sequences that way, or you could mix styles. But let me say, I'm going to go back and um, share the screen again. And we'll look at one more. I think it's similar to this one. Oh, let me just read that. Okay. The chat. Okay, great. You finished the t-shirt design, Kaylee. Thank you. <laughs> Good. I, we were just saying at the beginning of class, I want to get them to Kathy by next Friday. So if you can email, look at- Yeah, I sent an email like um, just earlier and I have it in the final, the file exchange thing. Okay. Um, I think I said I wanted it in ash gray, but- Okay. Because of, I don't know if you saw the design yet, but I have like lines that are supposed to be like see-through and I, the background is white, so I think it would just be easier to put on a, a white shirt. Okay. Um, Do you want to look know. at it with the class or? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Let me share screen. Yeah. Unfortunately, I couldn't find the Vista template too. So like, I I did it according to like the size of, of specification you had, the six by six. So okay. I think it'll be fine. Yeah, um, I'll adjust it. I'll check all of them and adjust them yeah. when they go out. And then I'm just going to send all the files to Kathy and she's going to place the order. So yeah, we'll fix it. Say. Yeah, I actually, I took this sketch from my sketchbook, this little cat in like the sweatpants and all that. Oh, it's so, cute. <laughs> yeah, I went over that just Good. because I thought it was cute. The sketches. Okay, great. So. Okay. Oh, I see what you mean. Okay. So you wanted this on gray. Yeah. I think the white would look better anyway, though. So I think white would be fine. It will print on gray. I think some of the cyan colors up here will probably bl blend in. Yeah. I don't know. I'd rather it stand out. I like that it's minimal. So I think white is good. Yeah. I think that would be great. I'd rather that. not complicate it. Okay. I mean, it's a really cool illustration. I like that it's simple, but it's also got a lot of like swirly aspects to the, you know, cats. I mean, I think it's a really, it's just a really nice illustration. So thank you. And I like the two different blues because it brings that, you know, the bedding forward. That's cool. Um, and separates it from the cat. So it's going to print great on a t-shirt six by six. You know, again, I'll just Check the template for each size, you know, and shirt style that you guys have sent in and make sure it's going to work before we send it out. So any suggestions that anybody else in the class has about this design? Um, I have a question for her. Uh, how did you do that? Because I had to do this on my phone. I was just wondering, how did you do it? Uh, okay, so I have a sketch that I already did. Like, this is my personal sketchbook, but um, this is literally just like a tiny doodle that I had done in the corner. I took a picture with my phone. I sent it to my email and then I place embedded it in Photoshop and I basically traced over it with um, with the paintbrush tool. So that's how I did it. Okay. Okay, that's a good way to do it. Yeah, and going back over it is good because I mean, it looks hand drawn. It's yeah, like, I, I basically redrew the whole thing again, <laughs> so. And that's what's really cool about it. I mean, it does. It looks like you drew it spontaneously, but it's got a really nice structure to it. And, you know, all the parts of the body look accurate and perspective and stuff. So having that foundation helps that than trying to draw direct. Yeah, I'm very new to like digital. So like I have this little Wacom ta tablet that I got like, I don't know how many years ago, but I'm just teaching myself how to use it now. So yeah, good. it definitely yeah. helped a lot. Yes, it does <laughs> help. Way yeah. harder. The mouse is so hard to draw with, and I use a trackpad, and it's so hard. So I will yeah. draw always things on paper first and bring them in. So there's a lot of different ways to do that. That's one way, drawing over it, which is great. You could also bring it into Photoshop and maybe use the threshold filter to Oh, yeah. It. Um, you know, there's a few different ways or use a different filter setting to simplify the lines, like find edges. So I like this way because it looks hand drawn and that's what you're going for. But, you know, there's many ways that you could do that with your drawings. Yeah. Uh, what do you think of the, um, the line weight? Do you feel like, I don't know, I feel like I could have made it heavier in some places, but I'm not sure if, it, if I'm just going too far into it because this is supposed to be simple. So, yeah, it depends on what you want. I mean, because you've got these nice heavy lines up here in the bow, 
and mm. kind of calls your attention. And then down here, you know, your eye goes down to the, the bed. So you have that sort of circular composition, which is nice, I think. I, mean, I think they'll print okay. I don't think okay. you need heavier lines. Um, I like the lightness of this compared to the heaviness of the filled areas. And if you made heavier lines, I don't know if it would detract from that. Right. Okay. That's what I was wondering about. Cause like the bum area, <laughs> I guess. Right. I was like, oh, I have this like heavy line on the tail, but I don't overhear. Does it look like it's like missing? But now that you said that about the face, I'd rather people focus on the face. So I think I'm going to leave that alone. Yeah. I mean, I like that you have the heavier line for the bum. <laughs> I mean, for the tail and then not over here on the bum. I like that you have the heavier line here and the lighter line on the other side of the tail because it makes it look three dimensional. Mm -hmm. The weighted one comes forward and the lighter one kind of goes back. And even though it's a simple drawing with just two lines, it feels round because of that. So playing with the line weight, you know, you can get a lot of three dimensionality without using a three dimensional drawing tool. And I feel like you do have that there. Um, this also kind of being on the side of the head brings your attention over to the heavier line, which draws you over to the face, which is prop, you know, where you want the center of attention to be. Mm -hmm. So that works. I mean, you could darken up this maybe curve here. I don't think it's, you know, that important. I mean, just to bring that or this line, maybe to bring that leg forward. Would okay. make it look like it's coming forward with perspective. But, um, I think it works as it is now. If you want to go ahead and print it, it's fine. Okay. I, I yeah, I'm not going to make extra work for myself. Yeah, you know. I don't want to mess with it too much. I like it how it is. So. Me too. I think it's great. Thank you. Yeah, it's going to print really nice and clean on a white t-shirt. So I think that's a good way to go. Yeah. Yeah. I can't wait to see that. Okay. Let me, um, oops, stop share here. And what time is it getting to be? Three o'clock. Okay, um, we'll look at one more really short video. And um, then we'll go into the demonstration with timeline. And um, because you just came to the class, I have these step-by-step -step instructions. It's like five pages. It seems daunting. <laughs> but okay. it's using timeline in Photoshop to build an animation with um, frame animation, so it's sort of like flipbook animation sequencing. Oh, and okay. Taking that and saving it as separate videos and then bringing it in to the video timeline and then using it as a video uh, to put them next to one another so you can get a okay. longer video. And then saving that out as a final video and adding an audio track. Interesting. So that's all here. And that's in your readings. It's the first one at the top now, uh, PDF. Okay. So you can print it or read it from there, but you know, read through it first. And the new assignment is up in the assignments, the new assignments folder. Mm -hmm. so read through these first to get an idea for the process before you start building the video and the animated segments for the video. Yeah, my experience with animation is pretty limited. <laughs> if you ever heard of like Flip Note Hamtana, it was on the DS, like from I don't know how many years ago. But I used to love playing on that and I would like do little animations and there's some people, um, there's actually somebody on YouTube that still uses that application and they make really wonderful little animations of like animals. I love them. But, yeah, um, I love some of the older apps are the more handmade, you know, drawings on different apps. They're just really cool. I find them more compelling than some of the slicker. Um, pre-made sort of drawings like in the horror movie one. So yeah, it's interesting to see all those that are out there. You can develop your own style. Um, sometimes they carry the story in a more interesting way, but this is like doing flipbook animation. So it's the similar process. Yeah. Um, but you just have a little bit more freedom in how you choose to use it. And then the timeline is more like doing you can use it for animation. I really don't like the timeline type animation like we're going to use for video for animated segments in Photoshop. But, um, you know, that's there too. It's just a different kind of process to get something to move across the screen. But unlike After Effects, where if you take graphic design, um, I think it's two or three, you'll be using that and you can make pre animated like the characters in the horror movie video where the legs are moving. Then you can move that across the screen with the moving legs. Photoshop doesn't let you do that. 
Mm -hmm. so we have to kind of do it by hand, which is what we're going to do. <laughs> so let's go look at a, not, one last example and then we'll go into the demo. Um, I think it's this one. Yeah. And this is really simple. <laughs> I missed you dearly, thought I was nearly dead, forever at last, together. Is our time fleeting? Is even meeting a healthy idea or am I getting too near? Don't try to fight it, you're here for the night. And I'll be waiting for you until we meet again. It's scary, but don't be wary. If we don't have that long, let's not waste it feeling wrong. This isn't the end. I'm your lifelong friend. Sure, it's been a while, but I'll be here when you smile. So don't try to fight it. You're here for the night, and I'll be waiting for you until we meet again. Just try to get through And don't try to fight it You're here for the night And I'll be waiting for you Until we meet again I'll be waiting for you Until we meet again So what did you think about that one with that? It has a similar style as the last one, but it's more like a kid's book almost. Um, yeah, I see a lot of those style animatics on YouTube. Yeah. I they're, think they're cute. I yeah. think it, like it's a really fun and easy way to um, like give an animation feel um and to like share a narrative without necessarily needing again to have like a ton of animation experience and to do something highly detailed you can still get your narrative across without having to overcomplicate it which sometimes fits more with a narrative anyway yeah i like it, it does have an emotional i mean it's kind of and it's hard i mean even with a really complex I'm like some of the Pixar animation I like, but the animation is so slick that it feels less emotional, even with a simple story like that. Yeah, I can understand where you're coming from. Something about having something a little bit more simple gives it more of that like raw feeling. Yeah. I mean, we'll look at Pixar next class and look at some examples because they do. I mean, they have some great short animations and they've been putting them out there. Um, with that 3D style, but I tend to, I don't know. I mean, these do look unfinished, like almost a sketchbook coming to life, and that's what I do kind of like about them. They're a little bit rougher. I can feel more of the emotion coming through. Yeah, but something about 2D, like hand-drawn animation is something that a lot of people, especially I find that are in like art communities, really miss because it has that personal touch to it, because you know somebody is hand-drawing that, where in 3D animation, it does take a lot of work and you can put personality into it. Glenn Keane is a really good example of that. He worked on, ta um, he worked on Tangled and um, I feel like he added a lot of these really nice character moments in his animation. But um, something about hand-drawn just, it's a lot more personal because there's one artist 
working on those key frames. Whereas, you know, something like with 3D work, I feel like it, it's just a different process. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah. I think that um, Pixar and that style, the 3D graphics became really ubiquitous about 10 years ago and people got tired of it. The story mm. started started to feel repetitive, even when there was something more emotional um, or more original, I should say, they still felt repetitive because the style dominated. And now people, are, I think that's why they're attracted to those animatics right. and popular. I was gonna say, did you um, hear about the Pixar movie Soul that was supposed to come out? I think yes. it might be on Disney Plus, but um, oh, I what think that one's a very more unique story than what they usually go for. Um, at least as of late, where it's about this like jazz singer. Um, so I, I think giving a look at the trailer at some point would be worth, you know, discussing. Okay. I think I didn't get to see it yet myself, but um, I'll see if I can. That it. feels a little bit more traditional. I don't know what it is. Um, oh, good. I'm thinking they are coming back. Did you see it, Wendy? Did you like I'm it? Pretty, I'm pretty sure it's on Disney Plus because I have Disney Plus. I'm not sure. I haven't seen it. I haven't looked at it, but I know it was coming on to Disney Plus. Okay. Yeah. All right. Mine's I'm expiring in December, so I need to hurry up and finish Mandalorian and go watch that, I guess. Oh, I finished that. But yeah. cool. um, The <laughs> one I was going to say about the two, 2D design is like um the like when you create a certain character like you build like like if like you feel connected to that character like that's why i feel like because i always draw like i draw 2d mostly i focus on 2d drawing and mostly all my drawing i, I build like a certain like when i draw a character like it feels like a part of me that i'm doing something like special I yeah i like that i agree with you yeah i really i do connect more with the 2d characters um, I think that Pixar is working really hard to make their 3D characters connect in the same way. I don't, you know, we'll see. I mean, I'd, I'd like to see that. I'll see if I can get it on Amazon Prime and we can look at that next class. But I agree with you about the 2D characters. That's kind of my preference too. And I think that because the lines can be so wild and, you know, have the illusion of a lot of motion, even with simple animation, that helps too. Um, but, you know, it's just a personal preference. But thanks for sharing the um, the flip note animation link. That's great. So for everybody, you know, check out that link. It might be something you want to use. And you can, um, you know, again, if you have an app that you like, you're welcome to use it. Just try to keep the personal story. The story is the important thing. If the story's flat or it's too disjointed or you're not focusing in on some kind of key element of it, that makes it interesting, then it doesn't matter how you animate it, it's not gonna be an interesting video. So really focus on the story, the storyboard, trying to sharpen that up. It's kind of, you know, a combination of writing and art, um, but that's the important thing. That, like the last one, you know, it's fairly compelling because it's simple, but there's a lot of emotion that comes through that, and, you know, whatever the friendship is. And I think that that's the key there. So, um, yeah, any other comments or concerns about this assignment at all? Um, I, have a question. Uh -huh. I have a question. Um, how would you do, like, if, if I would, like, try to draw a hand drawing on, like, do I have to draw on paper, then take a picture of it, and then redraw over again? Would that happen? Would I have to do that, or do I have, can I do it in a computer? You can do it on the computer. Um, I was going to say, maybe you could even just use the photo, the hand-drawn photo. And... Okay. Yeah, I mean, it kind of looks like the last one was a series of drawings on paper that they probably photographed with a camera. Or you could, you know, if you don't have a scanner, your phone camera is fine. And then just brought each piece in to some app to piece them together which you can do with Photoshop. So you may, you don't have to draw on the computer at all if you don't want to. So I tend to like that too. Um, so, well, I'll show you the example that I have. It's just a short animation that I put together with Photoshop really quickly and it's not finished, but we'll look at how to do it step-by-step step in Photoshop so you can get a feeling for what you can do. And then maybe look at some of the filters on a hand drawing and see how you can change it. And that, that might, might be help. cool. Okay, so 
Let's see how this goes. Uh, my computer, uh, with Photoshop animation, again, the memory on your computer is going to come into play. So it can be more buggy if you don't have a lot of memory to work um, with video and animation. If that's the case, we're going to keep it a lower resolution. We're going to work at 720 pixels per inch, which is an OK resolution to show on anybody's computer screen. But um, the, it's, a, it's less than 1080 high resolution, so it won't be as buggy in Photoshop, and the files won't be as big. You could even go down to 480 if you find that you're having a problem with your Photoshop. But we'll look at that. Let me go to share screen and Photoshop. Okay. So here we'll look at the, this has already been converted to video. I'll go back and go step by step through what you can do. And um, I added an audio track here. This is the timeline video rather than the frame animation. And then these are separate videos that I saved out from frame animation. And then you can just place them in one by one by going to add media under this little film strip and put them next to one another. And then Photoshop allows you some little transitions. There's underneath this icon right here, and we'll go back through it again. There's fades that you can drag between clips so you don't have to have just an abrupt sort of pasted look. Kind of like that last video where the images were fading in and out of one another, you can get that effect. And you can change the timing on them to make them look very soft and faded like some of those segments with the friendship video. So I'm just going to hit play to go through it from the beginning. And it's pretty funky, but these are images that I drew on paper. I draw a lot of dogs for my friend. We use them for fundraising materials. And I'll probably give her this <laughs> that she can use on something uh, when it's finished. But they were originally designed for t-shirts and um, other print material, but I just brought them into Photoshop and then added to them to make the animation. And this was found audio on YouTube. We'll go through how to find it, download it so you can use it. And I need to slow this down. So that's it so far. That little short segment took about a day to put together. It's very time consuming. That's the only drawback to doing animation. But I like the thought bubble kind of thing for telling the story in text. Um, I know you see it a lot, but I kind of feel that it personalizes it rather than doing a voice over where I could have had uh, my husband or somebody kind of read that text over the top of the video. But to me, that always feels less personal in some ways. So I kind of like the text there to reinforce the meaning. And I'm not sure about the sound yet. I just found that because it was copyright free and had an upbeat kind of sound to it. But I probably would add something else. And it needs more segments. The one drawback about Photoshop, now that I look at this and I've brought all the elements in his video, it, I can see that the timing where there's text that you have to read is really going too quickly. So I would have to go back and start with the original file again and redo it all. <laughs> um, not the drawings, but the animation segments. So let's go back to see, this is the last thing you'll do. So let's go back to the first. Um, Okay, so if I want to take this and now add another frame at the end of this, another segment with more talking dogs with thought bubbles, we'll do that. And this is how you're going to create your animations. 
So again, these were drawn on paper. I took a photo with the camera, brought it into Illustrator and used Live Trace. And I tend to do really sketchy kind of pencil, like heavy pencil sketches. So everything kind of blends together. So I went back over it and added sort of these bursting lines and stuff in Illustrator. And you could do that in Photoshop if you bring in a drawing. Um, let me see if I can find just an original drawing. Um, and we'll start from scratch. Actually, I should just start from scratch and make a new one. So what you're gonna do is go to Photoshop and new when you just start doing one animated segment and then come up here to the top. It has different application sizes. Um, I chose film and video because I wanted this to play on a, video, a computer screen. But if you wanted to use, you know, send your image, your animation to Instagram, you might want to use mobile. But I went to film and video and here I chose instead of the highest resolution 1080 I chose 720 just because it's more workable in Photoshop and easier to upload to Blackboard in the end. So now I'm hitting create. This is 1280 720 pixels at 72 pixels per inch, which will work well on an average computer screen. And you get these lines, they're guidelines. They're really just showing you where to keep your text. It, your image is gonna come all the way out to the edge. These are just safety lines. They're not gonna show in your final video. So I try to keep all the text bound within that just in case somebody has a lower resolution screen and it goes off the edge, but that's not really that important. And now I'm going to find my image that I wanna work with, so I'm going to file and place embedded and this image was done for a different application for a t-shirt print so it's a different size altogether so i have to figure out how to work with it here so i'm going to expand it a little bit and then flip it so the dog I'm gonna have the thought bubble coming out this way. So I'm gonna put this one over to the right. And then I'm gonna go get a gradated background on the layer below this. And maybe choose radial instead of linear. So it looks like it's kind of emanating out like this one over here. So it looks similar. And I still have a real distinct cutoff, which I don't like here. So just like you're working already on a still image, I'm gonna go back and this has a smart object because I placed it. Um, I wanna take that off. I'm gonna shift this down a little bit first. Yeah, yeah, a tiny bit so the ear isn't bumping off the top. And now go up to layer, rasterize, smart object. And then just a race around the dog so it looks like these merge together a little bit. Whoops. And get a much bigger eraser tool. So when you're first starting to put together your animated segments, whoa, too opaque. Oh, um, you're just working on them like a bunch of still images and using all the same tools that you use to compose images for your other assignments that were still image assignments. Whoops, too far. Okay, because I'm going to add the thought bubble and some other things. I'm just going to leave it like that for now. And I'm going to save this as the first frame. So what you see is what you get with the JPEG image. To build your animated sequence, you want a whole series of JPEG images. So this is going to be my first one. I'm going to go to file and save as. And I'm putting this all in the assignment eight animation folder. But for this sequence, I want a new folder within the folder just for this dog. So pink dogs, <laughs> whoops. 
create that. And now I'm going to save this as um, Pink Dogs 1 and then change the format to JPEG and save it at the highest quality, which is really not a big file. And it's going to be compressed anyway when you save it out for video. Okay, so I want to give some character to the dogs and I don't want to spend a lot of time on it because it'll bore you to death. <laughs> but I'm going to add like blinky eyes, I think, and just make their mouths move a little bit. So I'm just going to add one more frame to do that. And the way that I'm going to do that or make one more frame is to duplicate this layer now. So I don't have to go back and start from scratch. Um, the background is still showing through is the gradient fill and that'll stay consistent. And now I can go back in and just redraw parts of this or use the smudge tool. Maybe if I wanted the eyes to blink a little bit, I would just use the smudge tool to move the eyes so it looks like the lids are coming down. And it doesn't take much to give a little bit of life to your animation. And that's the way some of those uh, were, that last animation we watched, were really just a series of still images with just a few little motion bits being put in. And maybe make the dog look like it's smiling a little bit more in this one. And this one um, needs something, maybe a tongue. <laughs> I don't, let's see. Oops. Too big. <laughs> so a lot of times I'll use combinations of found things that I find online, like that little dog in the other video um, that I added to the last one, the silhouette figure, and then some hand drawing, and then some drawing that was done on paper. And this one I want to look like he's talking, so I'm going to just choose a color from the image, sort of that dark brown black for the mouth. And I'm just doing this really quick, so it's going to be funky, but I want to just sort of give him a lower lip that looks like it's opening a little bit. Okay, and maybe some white teeth. Ooh. On that side, <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to save this now. And this time, I don't want to save over the first one. I'm just going to call this Pink Dogs 2, because that's going to be my second image in the sequence. And make sure you change this each time to JPEG until the very end, um, and we'll save the whole file. Same image quality, same size. And now I'm going to go back to the first one and duplicate that. And then move that up to the top of the layer stack. My computer is so slow today. Come on. There we go. All right. So you can kind of get an idea of how the mouth is going to look just by clicking <laughs> the eyeball icon on and off. You can see how the two are going to react when you place them next to one another in the animation timeline. So in this one, um, 
I'm not, I'm just going to draw the thought bubble with a big brush. Oops. Okay, and then just choose the text tool. And I had just been using black text for consistency, so I'm gonna just choose that again. And then I was using, I wanna find the same text font that I was using for the other ones, which was Arial Rounded. And then on top of this, Okay, I'm just going to, whoops. Find a good point size for this thought bubble that's readable. Maybe a little bigger. I think I was using 48 on the other one, so I might stick with it, but anyway. Um, and then just figure out something for them to say. <laughs> um, I don't know how to spell. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to shrink down the, well, actually, I'll move it up first. And then just change the font size to maybe 42 so it fits a little better. Okay, so now I'm going to save this one. doesn't matter what order you number them in. I just kind of do this for my own organization so I know that they are all related images, all, all intended to be in the same sequence. When you go to bring them into the animation timeline, it changes up the order anyway, no matter how you bring them in. And you have to fix that in animation, but in the timeline. But I just like to number them to keep them organized so I know they're in this set and what sequence they're supposed to be in. Okay, so I'm just going to use these three so this you don't have to watch me drawing these forever because you can still get an idea for this. So after I've done with this, and I would add a few more sequences to it, I mean images to it, but um, I want to keep all these layers intact so I can do that. I don't want to save this just as JPEGs because I won't be able to go back to it with the floating um, text and this bubble layer. I won't be getting able to get back to the ones that don't have it. So I'm going to go back up first and save this as a Photoshop document and save all the layers intact for a working file, just like you do with any of your other layered images. So always remember to do that at the end because you don't want to be just stuck with just your JPEG sequences if you want to make changes later to your animation. 
So now I'm just going to close this window, or actually, I'm just going to open up a new one so I don't deshare it <laughs> at exactly the same size film video HD B720. And then I'm going to come over and automate this process. If I had a whole bunch of frames that I made, you know, 50 or more, it would be such a pain to bring them in one at a time. And Photoshop has an automated way for you to do that. So I'm going to go to scripts under file, and that's all in the step-by-step -step instructions. And load files into stack, and that will bring those all up into your layer menu in this new workspace. So I'm going to go to browse and then find all those dog pictures. I don't want the Photoshop document one, I just want the JPEGs. But I'm gonna hold the shift key down on my keyboard and highlight the ones that I want to bring into the layer stack and then hit open. And then Photoshop will automatically add those into that layer stack. So now they're all there to work with in timeline. This is your timeline down here. It appears as a separate window, at the, usually at the bottom of your screen. So you can pull it apart and have it as a floating menu. I like it down there, it's more convenient. And if you don't see that, just go to window and make sure that you open timeline by clicking on it to put an arrow there. And of course you want your layers menu open. And right now this is set, if you look at the middle of the timeline, it has a menu that gives you an option to change to the two different ways that the timeline in Photoshop creates moving images. One is video timeline, which is a keyframe timeline, which we'll talk about more, or create frame animation, which is kind of like your flip book timeline. So we're gonna be using the video timeline for putting together the video once we've made the clip sequences into video. But for, at this point, we want to create the clip sequences. So I'm going to go to create frame animation and it changes over to create frame animation. Now, this is a weird thing about Photoshop. You have to click on this again to make it actually kick in and be a frame animator. Otherwise, it'll just sit there. So make sure to click on the word again. And I did put that in here in big letters. So you know, because that is always a sticking point when people first get started. So now you're in frame animation mode and can get started. So you want to come all the way over. And of course, it's Photoshop. So it has teeny, teeny, tiny menu symbols, which is the next one you want to use is way over here to the right. It's one of those triple line square animation symbols that indicates there's another menu under here. And it's a really important menu. I wish they'd make a bigger icon because <laughs> this is how you bring all the layers in your layer stack into the animation timeline at the bottom. So I'm going to go click now on make frames from layers. And it will take every layer I have in the stack and put it down here in the timeline. Once it's in the timeline, you can watch it as an animation if I click either the space bar or this has some little icons that are supposed to look like a video play symbols. I can click that and you can see how it looks. <laughs> so it always comes up pretty funky because it is on the fastest possible speed, which is a split second, um, less than 0.1 seconds, which never looks good. <laughs> you want to give it a little bit slower timing and you can go in and change all of these by clicking on these. Now they're workable animation frame files. You'll see underneath there's a timer. It says zero seconds here. If I change one, if I've highlighted other ones, it defaults to no delay and you want to have some delay so people can see the individual images so it just doesn't look like a flashing thing. So I'm going to go to point two to slow it down a little bit and now see how it looks. And now I can get a better feeling for how the different frames come together. But because it's fast enough, they still look like they're moving. And I would probably add some individual frames between those mouth movements to make them look more complex and clean it up. But it looks OK. It does have the illusion of the mouths opening and closing. But the text one is going way too fast. Nobody can read that. So. 
I'm going to isolate out that text one. And actually, I wanted that at the end of the sequence, even though it's looping, it's not going to save as a loop. Um, you can see underneath here, it says forever. That means it defaults to looping forever when you're previewing it in Photoshop. But when you go to save it as a video, it's not going to come out as a loop. It's just going to have the one run through. So you want to have it in the order that you want it. You can pull these little segments around your frames. So I want to start at the first one. I can click on it to see that. I want that one to be the second one. So they start out with their mouths closed, open their mouths, and then the thought bubble comes up. So this one I want to be very slow. People need at least three to five seconds to read something like this with just a few lines of text. So I could choose five seconds, maybe even slower. Um, if I go to other, I can um, put in a custom time. I'll put six seconds there. And then now play it and see how it looks. So always give it a little bit more time if you have text than you think that you need because you're used to seeing it and reading it, so you can read it faster, but other people aren't. They need a little bit more time to read it. So this is slower than feels comfortable, but I think that it will probably work best. But I want to have sort of more chattery looking movement in the dogs before the thought bubble comes up. So I can duplicate these frames if I want to have more back and forth with the mouth movement. So I'm just gonna select one and then duplicate it by clicking this plus sign next to the trash can. And that made a second copy of that first frame, which I'm gonna drag back behind the dogs with their mouth open. Now I'm gonna click on the mouth open dogs again and then duplicate that one and put that behind the one with the mouth closed and then do that one more time. Okay, so now the dogs should look like they're chattering for a little bit before they go into the thought bubble. And it goes by really quick again. I think these are too fast, so I'm gonna slow these down to 0.5. And then the last frame is six seconds. So I'll just run through the timing one more time and then save it so you can see how to do that. Whoops. <laughs> okay, so that's kind of too slow. And so I probably would change these back to three seconds instead of two. So you just go on and on with this, sort of tweaking the timing until it reads right to you. And these can vary. They don't have to be all the same amount of time. And sometimes that's more interesting depending on your image. And this is 0.3 seconds, so that's pretty fast, but you just depending on the image, you'll get that right amount of time that it, the motion kind of slips by the viewer's eye and doesn't look too speedy, but you're not losing the image at the same time or making it look like it's too jerky because it's waiting too long unless you want that effect. Okay, so that's pretty funky, but if that's how I want it, then I think that's okay for this sequence. I want to save it now. First, you're going to save your timeline frames just like you did with your timeline layers to create these frames as another Photoshop image, and that's hard to remember to do. Um, so just remind yourself after you create your animation, save another Photoshop document because that will keep your frames intact. Although if you want to make major changes to the frames, you have to start a whole new file anyway. 
Photoshop doesn't let you go in and tweak the frames by bringing in new layers and dragging them down there, unfortunately, or I have not found a way. Um, so I'll just put Pink Dog's timeline in this one so I know it's the timeline frames or frames and save it as a Photoshop document. And now I want to save this out so it's a video segment, an MP4 file. So the way I'm going to do that is to go up here to File. And this is, again, on your, um, it's on the printout, the PDF from Blackboard. But I'm going to go to Export, Render Video. So now this is going to take all these video frames from below the timeline and render it into an MP4 video that I could play on QuickTime or anywhere that I could play video. And I can also bring it back into the timeline now and piece it together with my other video segments. So I'm going to render video. And you can see up here, it comes up with Pink Dog's timeline.mp4. That's a good title for it because it tells me what it is. You want to leave the .mp4 so you will know that this is a video um, file and also it will load into any other programs that will accept mp4 files. And select folder. I want to make sure this is going into my animation folder so it's not floating around out there in my messy desktop, which it is. And everything else is okay. You want to leave this. This is an H.264 compression of this document, which is a very high quality compression that keeps it a reasonable amount of size for video, um, but also plays well. And it's something that's used commonly on YouTube, Vimeo, and other applications like that. It loads easily because it's compressed. It's not a massive file that will give Blackboard trouble, but it's still good quality and you want to leave this on high quality. Um, and the document frame rate, 30 frames per second is kind of standard film frames per second playback. You can leave it like that and then just click render. And it'll take a couple seconds. It takes a little bit longer to think about it, especially if you've got more frames than um, just saving your traditional layered still image. But now it should be out in my folder as a video file. So I'm going to go back to the final. And this is, actually, let me start a new one. This time, this is what you're going to do next step to create the video. Once you've got a bunch of those MP4 files saved um, by doing the frame animations, now you're going to go start a new one that's going to be putting them together. This is your video editing file, create. And instead of using frame animation for this, now we're going to use keyframe animation or timeline video, I mean timeline in your timeline. So create video timeline, click once more on that word, create video timeline, and you'll come up with your keyframe editor. You get a layer for placing your animated sequence images and a layer for your audio track. Um, people tell me that use this a lot, that you can layer up and you can create another layer. My computer can't handle it to like layer images on top of one another um, and make them semi-transparent so you can have like a layered image like we did with the still images. But next assignment, we're going to be using iMovie if you have it or something of the like for a PC and that can do that. But here you can't. We're just going to kind of sequence things together and put a transition between them. If you have a, a more powerful computer, you can try it. Um, adding another layer. But anyway, let's keep it simple. <laughs> so when I get in here and I want to start constructing a video from all my separate pieces, my MP4 files, I'm going to come to layer one. This is your video layer. And click on this little film strip looking thing to the right of the word layer zero. And that brings up a sub menu that says add media. And now I'm going to go see, search out that MP4 file, which is out here in the main folder. 
So there's Pink Dog's timeline, MP4, and I just click open. And now that pops up down here in my first video group, my first video layer, and I can play it back as a video through Photoshop. Okay, and I can kind of see how the timing is. And if you want to change anything in that, in terms of timing, you either have to go back and start a whole new like um, frame animation timeline and change the timing in the separate frames, or sometimes as a fix, you can click over this little arrow that's at the end of the frame, each frame, and you can slow down the speed here. So maybe I'll slow this down to 70, 5% or in that range to see it's going to change the duration of that video clip too. But see if it plays back a little bit slower if it looks better or I could speed it up and get fast motion. Okay, so that's not too bad. It's just going to keep looping through unless I hit the space bar to stop it. So now I'm going to go up and get some of my other video just by going back up. Oops, and I actually go to my little film strip. Sorry about that. <laughs> Add media. And then find some of the older ones that I had already made as MP4 files. And there's that one. This is your playhead. It gets sticky sometimes when this uses a lot of memory on Photoshop. It's good to close down other programs that you're working with. Um, if you find that things get sticky or your clips aren't appearing, it's usually a memory thing. You just have to wait a couple minutes. Okay, so that's the last. Well, actually, this is going to be the last one. So I can change the order of these just like I can change the order of the clips when I was creating the frame animation. So I'm going to drag this one behind the other one. And now this is more the order that I want to see it. And I'm just skimming the playhead over the top of it by clicking and holding my um, trackpad down or your mouse button and seeing how it looks with those next to one another. And it always starts out with a white frame so you can add titles into it or sort of smoothly add in your other segments. You can get rid of that if you want. Okay, so I'm going to go back over here and add my other two pieces of media that I had already made. The first one is the title. Rather than making just a still title, I made an animated title because it loads better always than a still frame or a still image. And it's more interesting. So I want the title at the beginning, so I'm going to drag that back to the beginning. Drag the playhead back so I can kind of preview it quickly. And then I had one more segment. So I'm going back over here to the film strip, add media once again, and then getting the other MP4 file that I had already saved from my other frame animation. And this one goes second in order. Whoops. So I'm gonna place that there. Okay, so now I can hit the space bar to play when the playhead is at the beginning and see how the whole thing looks. And you can see the text is kind of grainy on this and some of the images look a little bit jerky. It's going to smooth out when you go and render the video again. As soon as you start getting four or five clips in Photoshop, because it's so much for Photoshop to process this kind of timeline, video timeline, you'll see anomalies like sort of grainy text or things that are not um, loading as quickly as you would like. And that's why it, once you render it, it'll look fine on video. It's always good to go check it and play back the video to see how it is because you can recreate it easily enough if you do need to make changes or fixes. Okay, the other things that you can do with this are to put transitions. Right now, these have what are called jump cuts between the different segments. You can see it just jumps from the titles right onto that pink um, graphic. 
And I'd like it to be more subtle. So these transitions will help you do that. You can fade out at the end to black, fade in from black, or you can do what's called a cross fade, which is a pretty common kind of transition in video. And you, you want to drag that right between the two segments. So now you see kind of that fade in with some of the residue of the title kind of lays over the top of that, which I like. Um, if you zoom in down below your video timeline, there's this little like two mountains with a triangle between them. If you drag on the triangle, you can stretch out your video segments to see um, them in more detail if you want to. And you can compress the timeline if you're adding more segments at the end. That doesn't change the timing in your video at all. It's just a zoom in and zoom out kind of thing. So if I want, I maybe could change the timing on the title to make it a little bit longer to accommodate that title, that transition that I just put in. So I'm going to change that to about 74 on the title. And that's a little bit better. And I can drag these over to the other, between the other segments. Every time you put in a transition, you should see a little black box like that pop up between the two segments and then you can drop it in there. If they're very short segments, sometimes you'll get a warning that it doesn't have enough timing in the segments to add that transition and you can make it a longer segment again, either by going back to the frame or um, you know, and changing the timing on your video yeah, that looks a little bit better. Or expanding out the timing here with this little triangle. <laughs> okay, so this is already almost, your timing is up here. This is about, if I zoom in, I can probably see more of that, yeah. This is 45 seconds already, and that's a fairly long public service. If this was a public service ad, which it may end up being, um, is pretty long. I probably would want to compress some of this, mostly maybe in this last one that goes kind of slow and keep it in the 30 second range. So you can see how many clips you need just to get about 30 to 40 seconds. These are only four clips here. so. You can get an idea of how many separate animation segments you need to build up to a one minute video. So it's a lot of work. It's time consuming. You'll probably need about six segments, but you can also repeat these segments. If I want, I can copy these and repeat them um, just like I did with the frame animation. So that's another option. You know, I can just load another one in. You know, I don't have to copy and repeat it. I can just go back over here to film strip and add the same um, clip in at the end and repeat them. And you'll see, especially like that one with the horror story, they used a lot of repeating segments over and over again, rather than creating original ones. All animators do, um, you know, the walking of the guy back and forth to the house, the people walking by the house, all of those are repeats to build the story, but to also add to the time. Okay, so we're getting a little bit late here. So I'm going to go um, over just how to add an audio track. Because I think most of your videos need it. You can record an MP3 file on your iPhone or your Android if you want a talking voice over um, and save it as an MP3 file. You can also do that on your laptop with iTunes or other apps. Um, if you want music, also an MP3 file. So there's a, you probably used it if you go to um, your browser and just type in, I put the URL on your printout page, but MP3, YouTube to MP3 converter, you can take music off of any um, video that exists on YouTube and save it as an MP3 file. Some people will copyright their videos and not allow you to do that, but most people let you have it. 
I always do a search for copyright free, royalty free though music, just so I won't have any trouble. If I go put it back on YouTube, like I'm gonna put this video on YouTube for you guys, I don't want any copyrighted music on here. So I went into YouTube and just searched for copyright free, royalty free music or MP3 files and came up with a video that had um, the kind of music that I wanted and then used the converter. You save the URL from YouTube, paste it into the converter program. It immediately converts it to MP3, gives you a download button and you just save it onto your computer. It's really easy. So I did save an MP3 file out. So I'm gonna go to audio track now and click on this little music symbol and go to add audio and search for that MP3 file instead of the MP4, which is in here somewhere. Here it is. And open it. Oh. Okay, so you can see when I put this in, it's a lot longer than my video sequence. Oops. It comes way over here because it's 44 minutes long. So I can shrink that down. Just by coming to the end of it, I'm just dragging the scroll bar over and letting my cursor hover there at the end and then dragging that back in so it fits my video way back over here. And I wanna extend it out a little bit further so the music kind of fades out after the video is gone. If I click over here on this little arrow on my green audio track now at the end of it, this gives me a fade out in a fade in menu. I'm going to Click fade out at about four seconds towards the end of the music and then fade in at about two or three, four seconds um, from no sound at four seconds to full sound. So it's usually better to bring a fade into your music and to your video so you don't get an abrupt jump for your audience unless you want that style. So now, you can see it sort of slowly fades in where there's still white where a title's gonna go, or credits, I should say, and then the title. Okay, and then it fades out so it's not just an abrupt ending, which viewers usually appreciate that kind of fade, gently leading them out of the experience of your video. Um, so I think we've got everything here so far. Um, let's see. Yeah, you can choose fade also at the beginning and the end of your video. So I'm gonna just put a fade at the very last part if it'll allow me to do that, because it's thinking. There we go, yes. <laughs> So now the video fades out gently like the music does. So at the beginning and the end, it's good to put these, put the fade at the beginning and end, and then the cross fade between segments. And once you're done, um, you just go up to file. And first I'm going to go to save as and save it as a Photoshop document file in case I wanna work on it more or change the video track, which I, I mean the audio track, which I probably do want to do.
So I'm going to save this as a Photoshop document so I have my layers and my timeline audio and video separate working document still. And now I'm going to go up and save, I mean, export render video to get an MP4 of it. So it gives me the name already, dog video three, so it's separate from my other MP3s and won't write over them. Same folder, going to the animation folder so it doesn't get lost. Format H264, high quality. It should default to that, but check it to make sure that you've got the H264 because any of these other formattings, you could also do QuickTime here actually. They're about the same, but there's other ones that are too high. Um, like 422 to say for a reasonable sized video. So now I'm just gonna go to render. And because I'm getting more clips in there, it takes a little bit longer for the computer to work on it. And that's always the trade off. We wanna keep these fairly short so you can do these at home. At the, on the computers at school, you can do a seven or eight minute video before they start to get kind of funky and we usually put together longer videos in seven minute sec segments. Okay. So I'm gonna stop the share for a second and I'm gonna go back to my desktop And I'm just gonna click twice on the icon for the MP3 file that I saved. It comes up in QuickTime. And then I'll see if it'll let me share that. So now, once you've saved it as an MP4 file, it will come up in the QuickTime Player program, or you can just go to your browser and go to Open File, and then you can play it back. You don't have to bring it up just through Photoshop. Or you can share it out to YouTube or online, however you wanna share it. Um, because now it's an mp4 separate working video file. So let's see if it'll just let me share the screen to go to QuickTime. There it is. Um, I just click play and now I can preview how it's going to look full screen. And it looks a lot cleaner here, surprisingly. And it always does when you play it back in QuickTime. Okay, so that's the whole sequence. It seems really complicated, but if you just take it step by step and break it down, just follow the instructions step by step, you'll see that it's actually fairly easy. And the more that you work with it, the more, the quicker um, it'll be to work with and to create the kind of video that you want. But for this assignment, just have fun with it. It can be very, very short. I think the hardest part, again, is just distilling down a story that you want to tell in this format and keeping it simple. Um, so it's still readable and powerful with this sort of simple style. But again, you don't have to draw directly on the screen. I think it's so much more time consuming. If you can draw on paper or if you have some drawings already that you just want to photograph and bring into Photoshop, it's much easier. Try using the filters, go to adjustments and threshold to simplify the palette that sometimes will give you sort of a more linear quality or a more graphic quality to your image and work with what you've got there in Photoshop and just use the paintbrush a very little bit along with the smudge tool to you know, reposition things. Or you can select parts of an image and move it with the transform tools. That's another way to go. So any questions before we quit? Okay, I'll put this video again as usual on Blackboard so you can review it. 
but um, try it, have fun with it. Don't get too frustrated. Let me know, email me if you have any problems or you know things aren't working in Photoshop, we can go through it. Next Tuesday, again, I'll have the optional class if you wanna come in and share your screen with the animation that you've been working on. We can work out any kinks that you're having with it. Um, but have fun with it and I can't wait to see what you end up doing. So I'll see you later and have a great weekend. Bye.